Hello. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be talking about uh, binary dependent variables. Now, everything we've done so far has been with ordinary least squares. Uh, and ordinary least squares is great, but it does assume a couple of things. And one of the things that it assumes is that the dependent variable effectively has infinite range. It can take any value. It's continuous and unbounded. Now, that's often not true. Most of the variables that we work with, in fact, couldn't really in literally take any value. Uh, they're constrained within some reasonable range. Like even something that's theoretically infinite range, like you could have infinite negative wealth or infinite positive wealth. Realistically, that's not really going to happen, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, even beyond that, generally it's, that works okay, right? You know, if, 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 it's, if that's a reasonable assumption, you know, maybe it's not perfectly continuous, but it's kind of continuous, and maybe it doesn't have an infinite range, but it has a pretty good range that extends beyond the range of our data, we're fine with that. But there are a couple of kinds of dependent variables where the strain on that assumption that we are continuous and in, in, infinitely bounded just gets to be too much. Uh, and in that case, we needed to use some other kind of model besides ordinary least squares to handle that kind of data. And the most common form of this is when we have a binary dependent variable, a dependent variable that can only take one value or another. This is so common because we are often interested in whether something happened or not. Like, let's say we put you through, uh, you know, some sort of uh, program that's supposed to make you more likely to graduate college. Well, did you graduate college? or not. That's a binary outcome. There's a lot of different outcomes like that. Did you survive to next year? That's binary. Uh, you know, so there's lots of different binary dependent variables that we're interested in, and OLS is not going to necessarily do such a great job of it. And let's demonstrate why that is exactly. So first thing let's do, let, let's start working with binary dependent variables, and let's still work with ordinary least squares. This is going to be called a linear probability model. A linear probability model is you just take ordinary least squares and you use it with a binary dependent variable. That is uh, it. That's the whole thing, right? So uh, what's going on with this? Why is it so bad? Is it so bad? And how does it work? So for one thing, um, how, does it, how would you interpret a model like this? So if we run this regression of the binary dependent variable on our, regressing, our, our, our independent variables that we're interested in, the nice thing is that we can interpret the exact same way as we would typically interpret in ordinary least squares, except now the, the, the outcome is in terms of a probability. So if we get a coefficient of 0.03, uh, typically that would be interpreted as a one unit increase in x is associated with a 0.03 increase in the dependent variable. But that doesn't make any sense here. The dependent variable can't increase by 0.03, but what it can do is increase by 0.03 in probability. So if before we thought you had a 47% chance of having a value of 1 in your dependent variable, well, now we're going to assume that you have a 0.5 uh, or a 50% chance of having a 1, right? So the interpretation is all the same. It's just that instead of actually affecting the value of the dependent variable, it is affecting the probability that the dependent variable is equal to 1. So that's how we can interpret it. So what's the problem with this? So I will say I'm an economist. If you're watching this and you're not an economist, uh, you probably have heard many more bad things about the linear probability model. Economists tend to like the linear probability model. It does a couple of things really well. Uh, it's very easy to interpret. Uh, you know, if you're only interested in certain kinds of slopes that economists tend to be interested in, then it works okay. It's great if you have a lot of fixed effects, but it has some real problems as well. Uh, first of all, it makes terrible predictions. Uh, and second of all, the slopes themselves are actually incorrect in some cases. So what's going on there with that? So first of all, uh, something that you might notice is that this is fitting a straight line and straight lines have infinite range. And that means that eventually you're going to predict that the value is the probability that you have get a one is either below zero or above one. This is always going to be the case as long as you go far enough out in the range in either direction. But often it is even the case within the narrow range of the data that you actually have. So here we have an ordinary least squares. Uh, oh, we also have a typo. I'll fix that later. Uh, but we have ordinary least squares line that we fit. Uh, and you can see that over here on the, that we have, you know, the, the, the ones tend to be grouped up at a higher value of x and all the zeros tend to be grouped down at lower values of x. So unsurprisingly, we have a, a positive slope. That's sort of what we'd want. But that also means that if we go to very small values of x, we're going to predict that you have a less than zero chance of getting a one value, which makes no sense. Right? The prediction is terrible. It makes no sense at all. But why is the slope also going to be wrong? Well, uh, that's because it's a straight line. And uh, what you really want is that you want the prediction and therefore the slope to sort of flatten out as you get towards zero or towards one, right? So what should the line do as it gets closer and closer and closer to zero? Well, we want to sort of curve away and not hit the, uh, the zero. We don't want it to give a negative prediction. And so inherently, because we have bounded data, the slope shouldn't be constant. 
Ordinarily, squares fits a straight line. It gives a constant slope. But we can't have a constant slope because if we go out far enough out to the side, eventually we're going to break the one barrier. So we want it to curve before it hits that point. So the slope should change depending on which x value you are at. OLS does not do that. So particularly, around the areas of x where we're close to 0 or close to 1, the slope is going to be wrong. Right? So if we're down here, we're going to say, OK, if we reduce x by 1 unit, uh, I predict that the probability is going to drop by 5 percentage points. But that puts us down here. It should say down here, if we reduce x by 1, we're going to drop the probability by mm, 0.01 percentage points. So there's not much more room to drop, right? If we're at 3% already, we can't drop five by 5%. Now, maybe 5% drop might make more sense in the middle here, but not near the edges. So in the middle, when we're predicting that the outcome has about 50% chance to happen, the OLS slopes are fine, but out near the edges, they don't work so well. So we have linear probability models. They have problems. What can we do instead? Instead, we're going to use something called a generalized linear model. So a generalized linear model has a lot of nice features. It works with a lot of the same intuition as ordinary least squares, and it's the same idea. So here we had an OLS equation, y is a function of x, but we're just going to take this exact same thing, this beta 0 plus beta 1x, and we're just going to run it through some function, and then we're going to use that to predict y, right? So instead of predicting y with, with that, that straight line, we're going to take that straight line, run it through a function, and then use the function of that straight line to predict y. That's the only difference, right? So we're generalizing it. We can see that it's a general version as well, right? Because if we make this function just, a fu you know, the, the function of x is equal to x, so it's an identity, then we're back to ordinary least squares, right? So we're just taking this ordinary least squares, I'm generalizing it by making this function not have to be the identity function. So what do we do with this? Uh, so first of all, let's get some terminology down. Uh, so this part here that goes into the function, that's called the index. It's the index function, or the, in, the index line, basically. And it's when we take all those, those, uh, those explanatory variables, they fit into some index. The higher that index is, uh, the higher of the, the value that we're going to plug into that function. And this function here, we're going to call that the link function. So we take our index, we plug it into the link function, and we come out with a predicted uh, value. So we have our index, we have our link, uh, and we can choose our coefficients in such a way that we are predicting our outcome value variable as best we can, right? That's the same idea as OLS, basically, uh, except that we're running it through this function first. So what kinds of link functions should we use? Well, there's a lot of link functions out there, I and mean, it depends on the kind of dependent variable that you have, right? If you have a variable that just can't be negative, well, that's going to give you one kind of link function. If you have a variable that has to be counting numbers, that might be a, a log link or a Poisson, a Poisson regression, which uses a log link. Uh, if you have a uh, dependent variable that takes multiple categorical values, you might use a multinomial link function. But the most common ones, especially when we're talking about binary dependent variables, are probit and logit. Uh, and uh, the link function for a probit is the normal cumulative distribution function, uh, which is basically for a given uh, z-score, uh, what's the probability that you get a z-score less than that, right? Um, and for the uh, logistic uh, index function, which is what use, is used for logit regression, it's the uh, e to the power of the index over 1 plus e to the power of the index. Now, the, the features that these have that are useful is, first of all, they can't possibly predict outside the bounds of 0 to 1. Uh, the, if you put in an index of negative infinity, you'll get a prediction of approximately 0, and it won't go any lower. If you put in a prediction of pos an index of positive infinity, you'll get a prediction of 1 and no higher. Uh, and then the, all the numbers in the middle are going to be in the middle there. Uh, so these are the link functions that we can use. Uh, if we set up these link functions, uh, we can fiddle around with those coefficients until we find coefficients that predict the outcomes well, and those predictions will never be outside the range of 0 to 1. Uh, here's an example looking at the predictions from Logit and Probit as opposed to OLS. So uh, in the two things that we wanted it to do, so first of all, it does not predict below 0, and also as we get closer to the edges, it curves away and avoids going away. So the slope varies across the range of x. Another thing you can notice here is that the predictions from probit and logit are basically the same. That's pretty common most of the time. Uh, it usually does not matter too much whether you choose probit or logit. Uh, so I'm probably going to keep using logit as an example because it is more common these days uh, in most scenarios. So two thing, brief things to note here before we go on to the next video. We'll have some more information about probit and logit. But one thing to note is that the slope here should vary depending on the values of all of the independent variables. 
right? So let's look at this graph here, right? So we can see here that the slope of the probit and logit is shallow over here. It's steeper up here uh, for different values of x. But what if we had more than one variable in the uh, regression? Well, then it, it, would, it would vary. The slope would vary not just with the values of x. It would vary with the value of the index function. The index function is going to be based on all of the variables that we have in our regression. Uh, and so it's sort of like, if you remember back to polynomials, we said the slope of the, uh, of the coefficient, or the slope of the x, the coefficient on x would vary with the value of x. And in the interactions uh, very video, we said, okay, well, the slope on x is going to vary with the values of some other variable. And here, the slopes on every variable varies with the value of every variable. Uh, if, all, if the prediction that you get from your model is very, very slow, if you're down close to zero, then the slope is going to be very shallow. If the prediction is more in the middle, then the slope is going to be a lot bigger for all of your variables. Because again, once you get down here, there's only so much further down you can go. And similarly, if we go out here to the right, there's going to be a point at which we, we run up in here. It's going to get shallow. So the slope itself is going to vary. Uh, so there is no one single effect of x. It depends on how close you are. So for example, uh, you know what's the effect of this, uh, this drug on uh, whether you get cured from your disease or not? Well, if you were already 99% likely to get cured, then you know, there's only so much it can do for you. If you were only 50% likely to get cured, it can do a whole lot. And that just makes, that's, it, that, that's what we want it to do. That makes sense. The other thing to note is that we can look at the actual regression table itself. Uh, so first of all, we see that here that the effect of X on the probability of the outcome in the linear probability model is 0.07. So an increase of one unit of X increases the probability of the outcome by seven percentage points. And in logit and probit, we see um, 0.53 and 0.32. Uh, so is that very different predictions? Well, no, actually. What these are, these are the probit and logit coefficients, which means they're the coefficients in the index function, which means they can't be interpreted as relating directly to the probability of the outcome. We can't interpret these in the same way. We also notice that the predictions for logit and probit were basically the same, but these coefficients are very different, again, because the index functions are on completely different scales. So we can't just interpret them next to each other. We need to do something, either interpret them as they are, uh, which you can do if you get really, really used to using logit and probit, or we can interpret them in the terms of marginal effects, which is going to be something we talk about in the next video. All right, that's it for probit and logit right now. Uh, thank you very much.